Tiffany's, 
there is like one wing that is completely um, like designer clothes. So, and it has valet parking, like it's a very upscale mall. They built it to try and make the millennia area a bit more upscale because it really wasn't. I know that a few years ago, I looked into moving to Orlando when I thought my company was going to relocate me. And I looked at living in the Millennia area because I thought, you know, if I want to go to a Starbucks or get lunch somewhere, I could just walk over, go to the food court, you know, everything I need would be right in the mall. But I read then that the Millennia area is actually a little sketchy and that there's quite a high crime rate there. And back in 2006, that was definitely the case. It was considered a bit more upscale from other areas, I think particularly because of the mall. But it was still an area that had quite a high crime rate. Um, so... As I said, they were still building the complex when she moved into it, and she was particularly annoyed by the construction workers. She told family and multiple friends that she um, was that they would always leer at her and that they would catcall her every time she came by. She didn't trust them whenever they had to go into her apartment to do some work on the inside. She would come home from work for lunch, let them in, and then she would stand out in the hallway on the phone to a friend the whole time until they left. She would lock up and go back to work. She didn't want them in her apartment on their own, and she didn't want to be in her apartment with them. There's a lot to do about these construction workers, and I will get into them a lot more towards the end of this video. She had a boyfriend named Rob who she'd been going out with for about a year. He lived in Fort Lauderdale, which is like just over 200 miles, so like close to 300 kilometers, I think, away. It was a, around a three-hour drive, and they would switch it up. Like he would come up and see her, she would drive down and see him, and they did this for about a year. And the weekend before she disappeared, she actually took a trip with Rob to St. Croix. They went away for a weekend uh, just to enjoy each other's company. There's various vacation photos of them just doing like typical vacation stuff. And on Monday morning, which is the 23rd of January, she left for Lauderdale around 6 a.m. and went straight to work for 9 a.m. Um, she had a normal day. She told everyone in the office about her vacation. And around 6 p.m. she left work to go home. It is the last time that she was physically seen by anyone. Her toll tag in her car pinged at the toll plaza, so she drove her normal route home. And, um, she got home. Um, sorry, on her way home from her car, she called her parents and told them all about her vacation. And then at 10 p.m., she called Rob, which is something she did every night. They talked every night before they went to sleep. She told Rob that she was already in bed. And uh, apparently, they had a little bit of a fight. They were fighting quite a bit lately about the distance. It was becoming hard for them to maintain their relationship being so far apart, but he didn't want to move and she didn't want to move and they were kind of arguing a little bit about that and they apparently had a small argument about it on the phone that night too. So, um, while she was away for the weekend, she had given a spare key to her apartment to her brother for him to stay out with some friends. Mind you, her brother lived in Tampa and he wanted to come to Orlando and spend the weekend, so she allowed him to stay at her apartment. He stayed there with his friend Travis and a friend called Matt, who is actually Jennifer's ex-boyfriend. Um, 
It was said that he took their breakup really badly and pursued her for many months after, but she had been seeing Rob for like a year. Matt had apparently moved on with another girl in the meantime too. I don't think this means anything because Matt has never been an official suspect in this case. And Matt didn't stay there either. Matt didn't live that far away, so he went home to sleep. He just hung out with the boys. He stayed really good friends with Jennifer's brother, and he just hung out with them at our apartment. Travis ended up forgetting his phone at Jennifer's place, and it was his work phone. He really needed it urgently for work, so she promised to FedEx it to him on Tuesday morning when she got to work. Her family is adamant that she was planning to FedEx it to him on Tuesday, and this does come back in the case. The next morning, Rob didn't hear from Jennifer, which he thought was a bit odd because every morning she would send him a text to say hi and, you know, wish him a good day, and she hadn't done that. But he assumed that she was just really busy because they had just come back from vacation and she was, you know, getting back into work and he didn't think too much of it. And then he tried to call her later that morning, but she didn't pick up. It wasn't until she missed an 11 a.m. meeting at work that her boss called her parents because her boss said that she never missed work. And this was an important meeting, so he didn't even think that she just slept in. He was immediately concerned about her and called her parents. They immediately made the trip from Tampa down to Orlando, and on the way, they called the building manager of her condominium and asked if he could go check in the apartment, which he did, and he said that everything was normal and that uh, her car was gone. So when her parents and brother arrived at her condo, they found evidence that she was there that morning and that she had slept there at night, so her bed had been slept in, the shower was wet, and there was a damp towel. Her lenses were missing and her glasses were on the nightstand. This was telling because the first thing Jennifer did when she came home from work was change into her sweatpants and take out her lenses and put on her glasses and she would just chill at home every night. So the fact that her glasses were on the nightstand and her lenses were gone indicated that she put them in in the morning to go to work. Um, her makeup and hair dryer were also on the bathroom sink. There were also two outfits that were let out on the bed. She um, bought a brand new pair of shoes that she was very excited to tell her mother about. And she told her mother that she was definitely going to wear them into work. And she was planning out outfits that would specifically go with this pair of shoes. So there were two outfits laid out on the bed indicating that she was preparing that in the morning to go to work. Um, missing from her apartment were her purse, her phone, and Travis's phone. So her parents called the police to report her missing, but she was a grown woman, so we all know where this is going. Police came around to uh, talk to her parents, and after finding out that she had a little bit of a fight with her boyfriend the night before, they assumed that she left on her own to cool off and that she, you know, wasn't, that they couldn't report her missing for a while. Um, they did check some surveillance footage in her neighborhood, um, but her condominiums didn't have cameras yet at that time since they were still building the complex. Um, they visited some pawn shops. They went to her work a week after her disappearance to talk to her colleagues, but not like really interview them, just have a chat with them. They took her personal laptop from her apartment and they took her work laptop. But in this whole case, police really failed. Um, they never did forensics on her apartment. They never dusted the upstairs railing for fingerprints. All in all, her parents just felt like this entire case was never properly investigated. Uh, they actually moved into her condo for a few months because they lived in Tampa and they wanted to be close.
close by so they could be on the police to keep looking into her disappearance. It was also a smart move because they could keep an eye on who came into the apartment complex, who left, things that were going on around there, just to get a better idea of what was happening. Um, they really took matters into their own hands. They hired private investigators. This is over the coming years. They had private investigators. They handed out multiple flyers. They held press conferences. They even managed to get her face put on the sides of buses all around Orlando. They just felt like police wasn't taking it seriously and they had to do everything they could to find their daughter themselves. So on Thursday, January 28th, two days after her disappearance, a resident in a nearby apartment complex saw her car on the news and called police and said, I think this car is parked by the pool area of my complex. And police went to investigate this and confirmed that it was indeed Jennifer's car that was parked there. Um, and it had been parked there for a couple of days. The uh, apartment complex was in a, for lack of a better term, seedy area. It was not as nice as the millennia area that she lived in. And Jennifer's parents said that she would never go there. She had no reason to go there. And it was just not an area she would be found in. It was incidentally also walking distance from our apartment. So she wouldn't have driven there even if she had gone there. The car was locked and reports say that Jennifer had a coded key, meaning it couldn't have been copied, so whoever locked the car had to have used Jennifer's key to lock it. Um, they called Jennifer's boyfriend Rob to come over. At this point, he was kind of their prime suspect, which bothers me for multiple reasons. I don't know if he was in Orlando or if he was in Fort Lauderdale at this time. I kind of assumed he was in Fort Lauderdale, but that would mean he'd have to have a three-hour drive just to come over to this car. The reason they wanted him there is because they had him as a suspect, and when they opened the trunk, there was always the possibility they were going to find Jennifer's body in there, and they wanted to see his reaction. But I mean, what kind of reaction were they looking for? Like, if my boyfriend is missing and police call me and say, we found his car, we want you there when we open the trunk, I wouldn't even know what to do. Like, you know, if they found him in the trunk, am I supposed to be upset? Am I supposed to be like, sh like not reacting, and if he's not found, am I supposed to be relieved? Like, everyone reacts differently. Some people completely shut down at bad news. Some people completely freak out, and then, like, her body ended up not being found in the trunk. But if, tra but if uh, Rob reacted relieved to it, would that indicate that he was relieved that she wasn't found? Or that he was relieved that they couldn't tie him to anything. You know what I mean? Like, I don't understand why they had him there just to see his reaction. Because everyone reacts differently to situations like this. Also, Rob is not a suspect anymore. He was in Fort Lauderdale, which I would imagine is the first thing you do when you have a suspect find out their alibi and be investigated. He was nowhere near Orlando. He is to this day still very good friends with her parents, indicating that there is absolutely no way in hell that he had anything to do with this. I find, I feel really sorry for him that they did that to him. Have him there when they opened her trunk. So anyway, um, they didn't find her body in the trunk, fortunately, and then they sent the car off for processing. Interesting that they processed her car, but not her apartment. So what they found in the car was a piece of fiber, um, a latent fingerprint, 
which to this day has not been identified. A DVD player strapped into the back seat, which I find extremely strange. A cell phone car charger unplugged and it was wrapped around the gear shift. Jennifer's sunglasses and her flip-flops and a bro broken mail key. I'm just mentioning this. Apparently, her mail key had broken a few days or a few weeks prior, but it had been replaced. It was on her keychain. I guess she just kept the broken key in her car, but it was found there. Um, if anything was found in the trunk, police have not released it. They haven't said that any, like, she had a work briefcase that was not found, or at least that nobody knows was found. Um, people think she might have kept it in the suit, in the trunk of the car because she only used it at work, but police have not said that they found it. They also haven't said that they haven't found it, so they're kind of vague. Um, things that weren't found were her car keys, her purse, her iPod, and both her and Travis's phone. There were no signs of struggle or conflict found in the car. The police do believe that the car was wiped down, but about one or two weeks after they finished processing it, they could turn the car back over to the bank because it was a leased car. I don't think they would have done that if they in any way, shape, or form thought that she was abducted in her car or that she was killed in her car. They couldn't find any evidence of foul play in the car which is why they turned it back over. Um, police did look at local surveillance footage of the apartment complex and found that there was a person who parked the car there and they can be seen walking away, but... The footage isn't clear enough to identify who this person is. The camera that was there was not an actual video camera. It took a photo every couple of seconds and it so happens to be that every time a photo was taken of this person his face was hidden by a fence post of the pool I don't think you can time that I think he was just the luckiest person in the world um, he wasn't really I don't think he was trying to hide his face I don't think he could care less that he was found on camera he was just lucky enough that his face was hidden every time a photo was taken. FBI, who got involved in the case, have released that the person is anywhere between 5'3 and 5'5. Five five. However, there are other agencies that have said he could be anywhere up to 5'11. NASA even got involved to try and enhance the photos, but they couldn't. Rob did say that when they opened the car, Jennifer's driver's seat was pushed back farther than Jennifer would have put it, indicating that someone else drove the car. However, Jennifer was 5'8". If the FBI is correct that this person is up to 5'5", five five, that wouldn't make sense. But if he could be anywhere up to 5'11", it could. Like, it's so incredibly vague what this person looked like. A lot of people thought he was wearing white and that it could indicate he was wearing some kind of uniform. But police have said that the camera completely wiped out the colors, meaning he could have been wearing much darker clothes than the camera was actually showing. So, um, police said that this footage was taken at 12 p.m. on Tuesday, the day that she supposedly disappeared. So they were now trying to find out what happened in that 14-hour window between the time that she called Rob and last spoke to a person and the time that the car was dropped off there. They do... <laughs> so... Initially, they believed that she might have been taken at night because, according to them, her cell phone pinged several times around like 10.30 and it was moving farther and farther away from her apartment. 
but the cell phone tower near her complex was broken, so the nearest tower it would have pinged off was much further away. Also, she had incredibly poor cell service in her apartment. She usually used her landline to make calls. When she did call people with her cell phone, she was usually outside in the hallway, and that was even spotty at best. So, um, her parents have told police there's no way that she left her apartment. She was already in bed. She was already in her pajamas. She was not the person to get dressed and go anywhere, and there was no reason for her to go anywhere. Some people said maybe she went to FedEx the phone, but a FedEx office wouldn't have been open that late, and Jennifer would have known that. I mean, police told her parents flat out that they didn't know their daughter as well as they thought they did, but honestly, my parents would say the same about me and they would be absolutely right. There is no way that you could get me out of my pajamas for any reason other than an absolute emergency. I have had many friends call me, hey, want to go to the cinema or want to join me for a drink? And I'd be like, I'm already in my PJs, I'm not getting dressed. Like, that's just not who I am and that's not who she was. Um, and her parents have since also said that the whole phone pinging thing was all over the map. That according to the records released to them, at some point during the night, her phone pinged at the exact same time in two different places, which is not possible. And that Verizon had pings all over the place. So those really can't be trusted. The police also said that at 1040, both her and Travis's phone were switched off. Again, her parents said that that's not possible because she used her phone as an alarm clock and they were convinced that she slept there that night and got up to go to work in the morning. Um, I don't know how they know this, but it was 2006. I'm not entirely sure that phone records and pinging were that up to date back then. So, there are a couple of arguments to be made for the nighttime theory. Her dad did say that while she was on the phone to Rob, there was a knock on the door. And she went to look through the people and said, oh, it's just the upstairs neighbor. I'm not going to open the door. Uh, it could be that she decided to open the door afterwards and that something happened. It could also be that she thought it was a knock on her door, but when she didn't see anyone, she said, oh, it was the upstairs neighbor, meaning someone knocked upstairs. Um, it is not likely that this had anything to do with her disappearance. Her mother also said that there was a men's Banana Republic sweater found in her laundry, and that that could possibly indicate that there was a man in her apartment that night, and something happened, but a lot of people have said it could also just have belonged to Jennifer. The first thing she did when she came home from work was change into her sweatpants. There's a good chance she bought a large baggy sweater to go with that because she liked lounging in her apartment. Um, so the main theory that police are following is that she was taken either, that she was definitely taken in the morning either from her apartment on her way to her car or initially that she was carjacked but I think the carjacking theory has been thrown out the window because again they couldn't find any signs of a struggle in her car um so where the Orlando police did do a great job is that they followed up on a lot of tips and leads they followed up on over a thousand leads. Unfortunately, it didn't lead to anything, and her father was critical of the fact that, yes, they followed up on a lot of leads, but they never created leads of their own. They never found anything themselves to go on, which is why he believes that this case is still unsolved so many years later. They did conduct a lot of searches initially around the Mosaic at Millennia area in the apartment block where her car was found. They also knocked on people's doors in both complexes to ask questions, but again, barely anyone lived in Jennifer's complex. Um, they searched all wooded areas and all bodies of water in the area, but they didn't 
find anything. There have been a lot of unconfirmed sightings of Jennifer over the years, but most of these, if not all of these, are not very trustworthy and also nothing ever came of them. Jennifer's boss set up a $1 million reward for anyone who could come forward with the location of Jennifer and she had to still be alive, but no one ever claimed that money. So I'll now get into some theories. The absolutely most widely believed theory is that she was sold into human trafficking. And this is where the construction workers come in. A lot of people believe that she was taken by one or more workers from her complex. So here's the problem with, the, with these workers. When you're building an apartment complex, you never have just one contractor. There is usually a main contractor who works with a whole bunch of subcontractors. There are different people to do outside work than there are to do inside work. There's like... You know, there's building the outside, there's plastering the inside, there's plumbing, there's painting, like there's so many different people involved. And a lot of these workers were illegal immigrants and weren't, didn't have papers, weren't written down anywhere. So police couldn't really get a list of everyone who worked there because there were so many different contractors and a lot of them were illegal immigrants. On top of that, a lot of them lived in vacant units while they were working in this complex, which I don't know if that's normal. I've never heard of that before. I don't know if that's a normal thing in the United States, but I find it kind of weird to think that if I buy a brand new apartment that it has been lived in for a couple of months before I move in. So I don't know if that's normal, but a lot of these um, illegal immigrants lived in empty units while they were working, so they were there 24-7. Which, and uh, combined with the fact that she felt very uncomfortable around them and that they catcalled her all the time, they would have known exactly where she lived. They knew that she lived alone. And they would have known her coming and going. They would have known what time she left for work every morning, what time she came home from work every night, because they were always there. So this is the biggest theory. Um, I don't... I mean, it could be that someone, that one of the workers took her and just killed her. But the most widely believed theory is that she was sold into human trafficking. Um, and again, the person on the surveillance footage did look like he was wearing a uniform, which a lot of people think could have been a plasterer's or painter's uniform. Again, the coloring was not correct, so it could have been anything really, but it does look like it a little bit. Um, the only problem I have with this theory, and it's not really even a problem, it's just something that I don't understand. It is, for the record, the one I believe the most, but I don't understand why they parked her car at a different apartment complex. Say that they even took her in her car and police just didn't find anything and then, you know, dropped her off somewhere. Why not just park it back at her apartment? I mean, were they either hoping that it would never be found because it was a more seedy area of town, or were they hoping that police would think she drove there herself, but it honest, it like ultimately didn't change anything about the theories. They knew that she didn't park it there herself, and her apartment complex at that time had no cameras. It would have been so much safer to park it there again, so I find it a little bit strange that they would park it there. Um, but one of the reasons that I believe this theory is because they just had the best opportunity. There were only three people living in her wing. We know that one of them lived above her because she called him her upstairs neighbor, and I don't believe 
believe that anyone was actually living on her floor. So if she screamed or if she was abducted outside of her apartment, nobody would have seen it because there was nobody there. And these workers would have known that. Another theory, which I'm not discounting, I just believe it less, it revolves around two people in her workplace. One of them was a manager. Now, he was her peer. He wasn't actually her supervisor. But he made several moves on Jennifer. He asked her out on dates many times. She obviously was in a relationship, but she also had a rule not to date co-workers. And on top of that, he was married. Um, she told her parents about him, and they told her, to have lunch with him one day in the office cafeteria and very firmly say to him that she did not ever date co-workers, which, according to her dad, he believes that she did. Um, now, after she went missing, uh, he showed up at an event that her parents organized and gave them a secret Santa ornament from her desk. And after that, it kind of went silent around him for a while. But in 2010, another co-worker of Jennifer's, whose online name was Adam, but we don't believe that that is his actual real name. It was Adam, yes. Um, he filed a harassment suit against this manager who was his direct manager because, according to him, he had a relationship with Jennifer and made some very threatening comments after she disappeared. He said that she was probably eaten by alligators by now, and he said this to several people around the office, like he wasn't hiding anything. Um, according to him, this manager was, like, before Jennifer disappeared, would make very seedy comments about her boyfriend. Uh, he was obsessed with Jennifer, and they had apparently a, a confrontation about her vacation with her boyfriend. However, a few days after he made this, after he filed this harassment suit, Adam himself was fired, and there were several people in the office who came forward and said that it was actually Adam who was obsessed with Jennifer, and would regularly send her, like, emails complimenting her. Um, Adam claims that the manager was late for work the morning that Jennifer went missing, and other people have said it was Adam who was late for work, so there is a lot of he said, she said, or he said, he said in this situation, and it's very wishy-washy, and I don't really believe that either of them had something to do with it. Um, I find it interesting that there were several people in the office who said that it was him who was obsessed with Jennifer. I don't know if they were all management and trying to sweep this under the rug or if some of them were just regular colleagues because Jennifer's parents have confirmed that Jennifer told them about the manager, that it was definitely him who kept asking her out and that it was him who she had lunch with to tell him off. She never mentioned this Adam guy, so so it's a little bit unclear. I think police did investigate both of them, or at least question both of them, but ultimately couldn't tie them to her disappearance. Um, and then another suspect is a man not named James Hadaway. He was responsible for the disappearance of another woman in Orlando in 2009, and he took her from a club that Jennifer had visited with her friends. He could have seen Jennifer and followed her home, although I doubt it. Um, I do not believe that she was taken by a stranger. I just don't see that happening. I looked up what the apartment looked like, and similar to most apartment complexes in Orlando, it's not an apartment building on the road. It's, you drive in, there's a huge driveway, there's a lot of green areas, there's a fountain, there's usually a reception area, like you'd have to go into the entire complex just to kidnap a random stranger, and especially with this one, there were around 250 units unoccupied in her complex. They would have to be extremely lucky.
lucky to stumble upon this one unit that had this like woman living there by herself so I do firmly believe that it's someone who knew exactly where Jennifer lived and knew her routine and what time she left for work every morning so um yeah that's really all there is in this case I think police at some point suspected maybe Travis or Matt the two friends of Jennifer's brother I know that they bought they brought both Jennifer's father and brother in for questioning they gave a polygraph to her brother but not her father um my guess or at least this is what the podcast talked about and I I agree with it um Jennifer's parents and her brother were driving from Tampa to Orlando at the time that her car was parked at the complex, so they didn't believe that any of them actually did it. They were probably trying to get information out of her brother about his two friends that could possibly implicate them, but after talking to him, they were no longer interested in them, so my guess is that they you know, weren't suspects anymore. I also don't know why they would be. Travis was just a friend of her brother's. I don't think he knew Jennifer that well. Matt was her ex-boyfriend, but I'm pretty sure that he moved on. She definitely moved on, and it wasn't like they were on bad terms anymore. So I really don't think that, um, that they had anything to do with it. Like I said, I strongly believe that one or more of the workers had something to do with it, which creeps me out to no end. I mean, yeah, you buy something in a new building thinking, yeah, you know, I'm the first person to live in it, it's brand new, and you're excited about it, and then you get abducted by creepy workers. I just... I, I just, I find it so creepy to think of uh, that this happened with her. I will link her website down below, jenniferkessie.com. Her parents set it up. They are very much still updating it. They are actively searching for their daughter, or at least to find out what happened to her. Like I said, they recently appeared on a few TV shows, so if you're interested, make sure to look into that and check those out. I believe the information is up on the website. And that is all there is in this case. Um, thank you, as always, so much for watching. Do leave me your theories down below. I'm sure a lot of you will have heard about this case before, so if you have details that I didn't cover that might be important, do leave them down below. I'd be really interested in hearing them. And 